In this lecture, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is using Google Earth for geology. And this is something that isn't necessarily in the textbook, but um, if you've seen any of the other lectures, you'll know that I use Google Earth often for geology, and it's a great tool that we have now. Um, so now we use Google Maps and Google Earth all the time. Uh, it's so accessible on our phones, and uh, we look at, um, I don't know if you've ever switched from map mode to terrain mode or satellite mode on your Google Maps. Um, and these things tell you something about the surface without you necessarily um, realizing that you're, you're interpreting different things here. Um, so how is Google Earth uh, created? Well, it has to do with satellite and aerial imagery. Satellite and aerial images in Google Earth are taken by cameras on satellites or aircrafts. And uh, it's a collection of images. So um, as the satellite rotates around the Earth, it, it takes pictures, and then these pictures can be stitched together. So it's it feels more like a seamless experience when we look at uh, huge landscapes or if we uh, look at large areas of a map. Um, these images are combined into a mosaic of images taken over multiple days or months sometimes. Uh, these images are displayed as one seamless image. So as you cursor through a map online, then, you, then it looks um, seamless, but sometimes, I don't know if you've encountered this where you uh, you scroll through an area and it suddenly, it looks really different from an area next to it. And that's because it has more cloud cover or something that would impact the quality of that image. Now there's um, some 3D buildings or, or a terrain mode that's on Google Earth, which is really cool. And uh, this is a way for you to look at more 3D aspects, and it's not just an image. So how does it work? Satellite imagery is taken from satellites that orbit the Earth, and as it rotates over certain areas, it acquires um, uh, images. So it, it tracks the ground and calculates where it is in orbit versus the surface of the Earth and, and uh, collects imagery as it flies over, basically. It's the same sort of thing with aerial photography, but instead of having satellites um, thousands of feet above the Earth surface, you have an, an airplane that can takes that can take photography a few hundred feet above the surface. So of course, in aerial photography, we would get uh, more resolution, or we might um, be able to acquire um, photography in a really small area. Uh, one interesting thing that has changed even in the last time that I uh, gave this lecture is that drone photography now is a huge change. So we think about satellite photography, aerial photography, and now drone photography. And that's because um, drones are much cheaper to use and to fly. Um, if you think about uh, how you would acquire a satellite image, of a field, for example. So here in Ventura County, um, agriculture is a really important part to um, to the, the economic stability of the county. So there's lots of farmland. And uh, what they would do is uh, look at satellite imagery to check in on how their crops are doing. Is it time to harvest yet? Is there a, is there a disease? So you would maybe uh, purchase uh, an aerial photography, or sorry, you might purchase a satellite photography of your field, and that gives you a general idea. Um, but then aerial photography would give you an even higher resolution of your crop, of your acreage. Um, but that's expensive too, because satellites don't always go over your land. Um, so the satellite image you might want, it could be a few months outdated. But if you were to go with aerial photography, you'd have to hire a pilot um, yeah, and that has a plane um, to fly over your, your crops. Um, but now drone footage is significantly cheaper than all of that because it's just one person using a remote control on a piece of equipment that's maybe tens of thousands of dollars versus a plane that is uh, much more expensive than that. And of course, satellites are much more expensive than that. So um, there's a lot of different ways that we're able to get photography now. So uh, when we, you might've heard about remote sensing. So what's aerial photography and remote sensing? So generally that refers to the use of 
satellite or aircraft based on sensor technologies to detect, to detect and classify objects on Earth, including the surface of the Earth, and based on propagated signals. So if we have a remote sensing device, it's looking at electromagnetics of the Earth, for example, or any anomalies, um, any um, gravitational anomalies. Those are some remote sensing things that we can do um, from a satellite or an aircraft. And remote sensing can be split up into active remote sensing, where there is a signal that's emitted by a satellite or, or aircraft, or it could be passive remote sensing, like um, when uh, there's a reflection of sunlight that can be detected by a sensor. And so uh, some of you asked about LIDAR. So LIDAR is a type of remote sensing, and LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. So here's an example of LIDAR. So the picture on the, the right is um, a, a, an image, like a, a picture that I would take with my camera. And on the left is a LIDAR image. So it uses light from a laser to measure uh, ranges or variable distances uh, to the Earth. So these pulses combined with other data like um, any information we have about the topography um, can render a three-dimensional image um, and tell us more about the characteristics. So LIDAR is using laser technology in order to look at variability um, here. So based on this image, we'd say, hmm, that does look kind of like a bridge. And of course, if we have an image of it, that helps us understand what's happening. But LIDAR is just a way to another tool that we can use to understand um, Earth's surface. So LIDAR can be used for geology, but it has a lot of other applications, especially with the progression of virtual reality and uh, technology for self-driving cars. So here's some videos about the uses of LIDAR. LIDAR, light detection and ranging. Though LIDAR is used in a number of applications, we have chosen the top five areas where LIDAR plays an important role. Autonomous vehicles. If you've seen a self-driving car before, you've probably seen a LiDAR sensor. LiDAR works as an eye of autonomous vehicles. Imagine if your human eyes allowed you to see in all directions all of the time. Imagine if, instead of guessing, you could always know the precise distance of objects in relation to you. LiDAR enables a self-driving car to view the surroundings with a few special superpowers. Agriculture LiDAR can be used to create 3D elevation maps of a particular land, which can be converted to create slope and sunlight exposure area map. This information can be used to identify the areas which require more water or fertilizer and will help farmers to save on their cost of labor, time and money. River Survey Water penetration green light of the LiDAR is used to measure underwater and helps create 3D model of the terrain. Underwater information of a river can help understand the depth, width and flow of the water. It helps in monitoring the floodplains. Modeling of the pollution. LiDAR wavelengths are shorter which operate in ultraviolet, visible region or near infrared. This helps to image the particulate matter which are in the same size or larger than the wavelength. So LiDAR can detect pollutant particles of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and methane. This information helps researchers to create pollutant density map of the area which can be used for better planning of the city. For archaeology and building construction LiDAR plays an important part for the archaeologist to understand the surface. LiDAR can detect microtopography that is hidden by vegetation, which helps archaeologists to understand the surface. Ground-based LiDAR technology can be used to capture the building's structure. This digital information can be used for 3D mapping on the ground, which can be used to create models of the structure. It is very useful for maintaining a record of the structure.
LiDAR is, is a fool's errand. And, any, and anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. Expensive sensors that are, are unnecessary. It's like having a whole bunch of expensive appendices. Like one appendix is bad, well, now they want to put a whole bunch of them. That's ridiculous. So in the next section of my talk, I'm going to especially talk about depth perception using vision only. So you might be familiar that there are uh, at least two sensors uh, in the car. One is vision, cameras, just getting pixels, and the other is LiDAR that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, companies also use. And LiDAR gives you these point measurements of distance around you. Um, now, one, one thing I'd like to point out, first of all, is you all came here, you drove here, many of you, and you used your, <laughs> your uh, neural net and vision. You were not shooting lasers out of your eyes, and you still <laughs> ended up here. We might have. <laughs> so I mean, things I went know, well. That's good for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, the human neural net uh, derives distance and all the measurements and the 3D understanding of the world just from vision. It actually uses multiple cues to do so. I'll just briefly go over some of them, just to give you a sense of roughly what's going on in, inside. Um, as an example, we have two eyes pointed out, so you get two independent measurements at every single time step of the world ahead of you, and uh, your brain stitches this information together to arrive at some depth estimation because you can triangulate any points uh, across those two uh, viewpoints. A lot of animals, instead, have eyes that are positioned on the sides, so they have very little overlap in their visual fields, so they will typically use structure for motion, and the idea is that they bob their heads and because of the movement, they actually get multiple observations of the world, and you can triangulate, again, depths. And even with one eye closed and completely motionless, you can still have some sense of depth perception. If you did this, I don't think you would notice me coming two meters towards you or 100 <laughs> meters back, and that's because there are a lot of very strong monocular cues that your brain also takes into account. This is an example of a pretty common visual illusion where you have, you know, these two blue bars are identical, but your brain, the way it stitches up the scene, is it just expects one of them to be larger than the other because of the vanishing lines of this image. So your brain does a lot of this uh, automatically. And, uh, and neural nets, artificial neural nets can as well. So let me give you three examples of how you can arrive at depth perception from vision alone. Um, a classical approach and two that rely on neural networks. So here's a video going down, I think this is San Francisco, of a Tesla. So this, these are our cameras, our sensing. And we're looking at all, I'm only showing the main camera, but all the cameras are turned on, the eight cameras of the autopilot. And if you just have this six second clip, what you can do is you can stitch up this environment in 3D using multi-view stereo techniques. So this is the 3D reconstruction of those six seconds of that car driving through that path. And you can see that this information is purely, is, is very well recoverable uh, from just videos. And roughly that's through process of triangulation and as I mentioned, multi-view stereo. And we've applied similar techniques, uh, slightly more sparse and approximate also in the car. So it's remarkable, all that information is, is really there in the sensor and just a matter of extracting it. Um, the other project that I want to briefly talk about is, as I mentioned, there's nothing about neural network. Neural networks are very powerful visual recognition engines. And if you want them to predict depth, then you need to, for example, look for labels of depth, and then they can actually do that extremely well. So there's nothing limiting networks from predicting this monocular depth except for labeled data. So one example project that we've actually um, looked at internally is we use the forward-facing radar, which is shown in blue, and that radar is looking out and measuring depths of objects, and we use that radar to annotate the, uh, what vision is seeing, the bounding boxes that come out of the neural networks. So instead of human annotators telling you, okay, this, this car in this bounding box is roughly 25 meters away, you can annotate that data much better using sensors. So you use sensor annotation. So as an example, radar is quite good at that distance. You can annotate that, and then you can train a neural network on it. And if you just have enough data of it, this neural network is very good at predicting those patterns. So here's an example of predictions um, of that. So in circles, I'm showing radar objects, and, in, uh, and the cuboids that are coming out uh, here are purely from vision. So the cuboids here are just coming out of vision, and the depth of those cuboids is learned by a sensor annotation from the radar. So if this is working very well, then you would see that the circles in the top-down view would agree with the cuboids, and they do. And that's because neural networks are very competent at predicting depths. Uh, they can learn the different sizes of vehicles internally, and they know how big those vehicles are, and you can actually derive depth from that quite accurately. The last mechanism I will talk about very briefly is uh, slightly more fancy and gets a bit more technical, but it is a mechanism uh, that has recently um, 
there's a few papers basically over the last year or two on this approach. It's called self-supervision. So what you do in a lot of these papers is you only feed raw videos into neural networks with no labels whatsoever, and you can still learn, you can still get neural networks to learn depth. And it's a, bit, a little bit technical, so I can't go into the full details, but the idea is that the neural network predicts depth at every single frame of that video, and then there are no explicit targets that the neural network is supposed to regress to with the labels, but instead, the objective for the network is to be consistent over time. So whatever depth you predict should be consistent over the duration of that video, and the only way to be consistent is to be right. And so the neural network automatically predicts the correct depths for all the pixels, and we've reproduced some of these results internally, so this also works quite well. So in summary, people drive with vision only. No, no lasers are involved. This seems to work quite well. The point that I'd like to make is that visual recognition, and very powerful visual recognition, is, is absolutely necessary for autonomy. It's not a nice to have. Like we must have neural networks that actually really understand the environment around you. And, uh, and LIDAR points are a much less information rich uh, environment. So vision really understands the full details. Just a few points around are, are much, um, there's much less information in those. So as an example on the left here, um, is that a plastic bag or is that a tire? A, a LIDAR might just give you a few points on that, but vision can tell you which one of those two is true, and that impacts your control. Is that person who is slightly looking backwards, are they trying to merge in, into your lane uh, on the bike, or are, they just, uh, or are they just going forward? In the construction sites, what do those signs say? How should I behave in this world? The entire uh, infrastructure that we have built up for roads is all uh, designed for human visual consumption. So all the signs, all the traffic lights, everything is designed for vision. And so that's where all that information is, and so you need that ability. Is that person distracted and on their phone? Are they going to walk, walk into your lane? Those answers to all these questions are only found in vision and are necessary for level four, level five autonomy. And so in this sense, LIDAR is really a shortcut. It sidesteps the fundamental problems, the, the important problem of visual recognition that is necessary for autonomy. And so it gives a false sense of progress and is ultimately, it's ultimately a crutch. I hope you learned something new about LIDAR in other applications, but what about LIDAR in geology? Um, so here's, I have a link in the slide deck here, and I would like you to go onto this website and check it out for yourself because there's a lot of interesting information here. So um, this is how LIDAR is used. This is from Washington State, and they use LIDAR to expose geology and natural hazards. So let's take a look. There's a lot in this website. So again, I recommend that you go through it here. So it provides some information about uh, LIDAR, but then it also gives lots of examples of uh, LIDAR for things like landslides and faults. Um, so here's uh, some uh, different ways that we can look at elevation models and uh, elevation models with LIDAR can help us um, look at uh, topography maps and elevation maps. This also helps us understand maybe sloping. Um, this is good for like hillside stability and determining um, if there's a critical failure that might happen. Um, there's a lot of uh, applications with, um, uh, yeah, looking at geomorphology. So we can use LIDAR to tell us about where there had been um, streams uh, before. So if you remember from the depositional environment um, lecture, we talk about oxbow lakes and meandering streams. And using LIDAR can help show us uh, where those streams used to be versus where the stream is. So this is a blended image here of photography on the left and the use of LIDAR um, on the right. So there's so many things here on this website. Um, I highly recommend you go through this and check it out because there's so many really cool applications and uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of work that can be done um, using LIDAR and it's not just for geology. So I hope you find this interesting and maybe um, if you're in the arts or if you're in engineering or whatever your background is, there might be a LIDAR application that is pertinent to you and your interests. So let's look at uh, some examples of Google Earth, revisiting some of the topics that we've already talked about this semester. So I'm going to open up Google Earth here, and this is going to be um, this is going to be a review. So if we were to look at where plate tectonics are, this is also kind of like a fun recap because hopefully you remember all of these things that we've talked about throughout the semester. 
Um, so the first part of this semester was about plate tectonics. Well, we can clearly see the plate tectonic boundary here between um, South America and Africa. We can see uh, the divide here of the plates right from aerial photography using Google Earth. We can see the, um, uh, from quite far away, you can see this divergent plate boundary here. Well, what about igneous rocks? So one thing that's fun about um, Google Earth is that we can zoom into a place, um, but then in certain parts of um, Google, they have like um, Google spheres or like further information about a certain area. So if we zoom all the way to Iceland and we can zoom in and click on, um, you, can, you can see that there's information about this really specific um, this specific mountain here, but you can also find uh, you can also find information about um, certain rocks. And uh, if we were to try to zoom into one of these, uh, sometimes they have those Google spheres. Ah, very cool. Um, so Iceland is really neat. Uh, we've talked about Iceland before and how they have all their black beaches and that's because of all the volcanic activity um, uh, associated with, with Iceland. So let's look at a specific volcano. Let's um, bounce all the way over to Alaska. And here uh, we can see the volcanic chain here uh, around Alaska. And again, if we were to click on some information here, it tells us about the mountain or tells us about uh, these different features in Google Earth. So if you're taking a lab associated with this class, you will likely use um, Google Earth to look at volcanoes. We can use it to look at different depositional environments. For example, one of my favorites is looking at these alluvial fans um, in Death Valley. So here's that, that alluvial fan. If you remember when we talked about that, we can see the channel here and how sediment um, falls out uh, onto the valley floor in a fan-like way. Ooh, another one of my favorite features of Google Earth, I don't know if I've shown it yet, is that we can look at um, previous images. So here we are in Southern California. This is uh, the transition of Highway 5 and 14. And um, let me zoom out first, actually. So here we're in Ventura County down, down on the bottom left. And if we look at this intersection of Highway 5 and Highway 14, uh, you can see that uh, we can step back in time. And so from this image, you can see the highway collapsed as a result of the North Ridge earthquake. Um, and that is really fun in order to, to see how landscapes have changed over time. So this image was from uh, 1994. Here's the imagery date at the bottom. And you can see that, uh, that the bridge is, is totally collapsed. Uh, and of course, if we were to step forward, they, they fixed that pretty quickly. Um, uh, even though this image, the next image is a 2002. Uh, so this is a fun feature of Google Earth that you may not have known about. Um, of course, satellite imagery wasn't nearly as taken as frequently as it is now. So this image was uh, imported and put into this layer of Google Earth. Um, but another example of this is, I think I showed this before, is the Montecito mudslide. So if we go up towards Montecito, and we look at images that are taken I don't know, roughly every few years or so, just by default, we can step through time here and look at how in 2018, right after the landslide, uh, Highway 101 is completely covered with mud. And then, you know, we look at the time after that um, and we can look at the differences in satellite imagery and see over time how, um, how, how geologic processes take place right in our own 
backyard and right in our own time that we can measure. So we can see that uh, just a few months later in April of 2018, the highway is back open, but it is cool to see aerial photography of it being completely underwater. Okay, let's look at another one. Ah, yes, here we are. Um, let's zoom all the way out. So you have an idea of where we are. Uh, we are in Africa. And if we zoom in, here's an example of a, um, of a basin structure. And this is really cool. This is a, this is quite large <laughs> structure here. And um, uh, of course we can see this using satellite imagery, but if we were just a, a little person um, walking along this structure, you wouldn't see the same structures that you would see from satellite imagery. So that's why I think Google Earth is so cool because, um, because we get to see more than what we would experience if we're just walking. So those are some examples of, um, of uh, go using Google Earth for all the topics that we've talked about. Um, so I, I, have, uh, I have some slides associated with each one. So if you want to go back and learn more details about the volcanoes in Alaska um, uh, or these earthquakes and things like that. So this is going to be one of your homework assignments is to use Google Earth to find a feature of something that we've talked about already this semester. And it could be things like faults or it could be depositional environments or volcanoes, whatever interests you. And um, as part of this assignment, you'll have to name the feature, locate it, it, locate it on Google Earth and describe the feature. So one real world application that, that I've used in my job, um, which may or may not be pertinent to you, but I just want to demonstrate that that it is um, actually a thing that we use uh, is when I was working in the oil industry, uh, we would look at our available sites for drilling. So this is in Central Valley and near McKittrick, California. And you can see that all of these are little pumps, oil pumps. And if I were to try to drill a new well, I would have certain criteria that I would have to meet in order to have enough surface space to put this equipment. So I would have to look at, um, I would have to look at these features and determine, well, this place looks okay. So here's a box here. And those are my dimensions that I need in order to put equipment there and drill and put a pump head. So I would use satellite imagery to plan uh, where to put a well, a, an oil well. So that's a real life application of using Google Earth for a real job. Uh, another example of that is using, um, like I said, agriculture here in Ventura County is big, but also for other environmental reasons that you'd want um, to have aerial photography to, to detect any oil spills. This is done in the platforms offshore too, to make sure that there's no sheen on the surface of the ocean and there are signs of trouble with something that's happening uh, beneath the surface. So one last thing that is sort of in scope of all of this is using ArcGIS. And within the Ventura um, Community College system, Ventura College does have um, a GIS program. So if you're interested in learning GIS, I highly recommend taking some of those classes. And GIS is a, a spatial software that's used in a lot of different applications. And it's a, it's a, a tool to use to map things. So, um, so there's, there's GIS that you can use online through a browser. Of course, it costs money to get a license, but uh, there's a lot of things that you can do to make maps. Um, there's a lot of data that's available online for you to make these types of maps. And uh, uh, you can, use all of these tools for a bunch of different workflows. It can be used for city planning, um, looking at where you might need to build a bridge in order to alleviate traffic. It could be 
to look at, of course, geology. GIS is used a lot in geologic applications, like looking at um, different types of data, like sea level rise and things like that. But there's there's um, so many applications uh, and uses for GIS that this is a really great tool. Um, there's a lot of resources online, a lot of videos online about GIS because it's so widely used. So if you're interested in learning about GIS, um, I highly recommend that you take some courses or um, dive even deeper into this because there's so many applications and it's a really great skill to have uh, no matter uh, what your discipline is. So throughout the rest of the semester, I'll continue to use Google Earth for lots of examples and Google Earth is such a powerful tool. So I hope you found it interesting. See you next time.